Hello everyone, welcome back. I am Maxi of the 776 Gods, and today we're going to be discussing the canon lore of the 776 Gods. Uh, today we're going to begin specifically with the world of Zatera, which is where most of the lore was based when it was first created, and it's also where a lot of the stories and campaigns that I've done have taken place. So, the level zero of this discussion, there's a few different terms that need to be defined before we can really have a useful discussion and explanation on this topic, and that mostly boils down to levels of power, structures of power, and locations. Though we'll be covering locations in a different video. In the lore, there is a consensus between the gods and the mortals on what various tiers of godhood and, well, also being a mortal, mean and how you determine if you fall into that group. This consensus was more or less coalesced into a single document by a man in lore named Nyarev Petra. And the system, the document that he made, is called the Petra system. In the Petra system, there are eight tiers of godhood, which obviously does not include mortals. These tiers, in order of weakest to strongest, are minor gods, which are also called demigods, lesser gods, greater gods, elder gods, ancient gods, Shaski, Takyazar, and Silnior. The last three that I listed are in a language known as Veratian, and they translate to the following. Shaski translates to Great King or Great Lord. Takyazar most accurately translates to Heavenly Omnipotence, and Silnior literally translates to One Who Sees. Aside from the tiers of godhood, there are also different types of gods. The types of gods are mostly important when they are on a realm. So on a realm, you typically have four different kinds of gods. Three of them are actually official gods that are usually part of the pantheon proper, and the last type of god is more or less just one that sort of sits off to the side and does its own thing. These types of gods are the following. You've got arbiters. Basically, they're the head of the pantheon, or one of the heads of the pantheon. They give everybody else orders, and they make sure the realm is running smoothly. Right below them, you've got the enforcers. Enforcers are kind of like the muscle of the arbiters. They do a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to combat. They aren't exclusive to that role, though. They can do the things that the other roles do, it's just not their main focus. The enforcers also end up enforcing a lot of the rules, kind of like their namesake. Past the enforcers, you have the creator-type gods. Their job is typically just to populate the realm with living beings or their creations, make things more interesting, that kind of thing. Although, just like in the Enforcer's case, creator-type gods aren't locked into that, and they can do the things from the other roles, it's just not their main focus. But there's one more part of this equation that we need to understand, and that's the realm that the gods exist on in the first place. Realms are similar to planets, but they're not the same thing. Where a planet is a collection of material in space, a realm is a living being that has a shell around it, or in some cases, multiple shells. A realm like Zatera has two different shells, one is the actual world that you can stand on, and the other is a mostly solid substance that is extremely difficult for mortals to pass through. The outermost shell is mostly there to protect the surface and the people on the surface from the void, which is kind of like space, but it's way more destructive. Like I said earlier, realms are literally living beings, and they can exist in multiple states of awareness. Those states of awareness being anywhere on a spectrum between awake and asleep. An awake realm is extremely active, and by active I mean radioactive. A fully awake realm gives off enough mana radiation to kill most things that live on its surface, excluding the more powerful gods. These realms, since they're so dangerous, are also extremely difficult to destroy or even attack, and their secondary shell, if they have one, is probably one of the hardest substances in the universe though in war researchers will have to do more research on this subject to determine that. On the other extreme, we have 100% asleep realms. These realms are extremely safe to live on. There's no horrible radiation, and life probably finds it extremely easy to survive on it. The issue comes along with the fact that a sleeping realm is 100% unaware, which means it can't defend itself if something goes wrong, and without an arbiter and enforcers to help it, the chances of it making it very far are pretty slim. Realms exist in realm systems, and multiple realms can exist in one realm system. 
The issue is that if there are multiple sleeping realms, and they're just sort of moving around haphazardly, eventually they might bump into each other. And if two enormously powerful magical beings collide with each other, the results are spectacularly dangerous. This is where realm arbiters come into play. Realm arbiters are basically pilots for a realm. They commune with and channel the power of the realm to pilot the realm so that it doesn't crash into other things, which is great for both parties. Now with all of that information out of the way, we can finally get back to Zatera. Zatera up until recently was under the watchful eye of a god known as Yizar Drame. However, he recently passed on his arbiter status to a younger god known as the Night Valor, and also to the god that the realm itself created known as Saul. The reason that Yizar Drame passed on his arbiter status is because he's leaving to go to war and we'll discuss that war in a different video. Another member of the Pantheon that was incredibly important until we left for the war was known as Tok Haral. Now, as a small aside, you hear me using these words Yizar and Tok. Yizar and Tok are basically titles. They're celestial titles, where Tok means heavenly and Yizar means omnipotence. Though that doesn't necessarily describe the gods, it's just a title. But let's get back to Haral. Haral was an enforcer before he left. He was also one of Dreme's best friends, though they weren't always best friends. Back in the day when Zatera was new, Haral and Dreme were at each other's throats constantly. Haral saw Dreme as a pontificating jerk-off, mostly because of the title that he had at the time, which was God of Peace. Haral wanted to give him a huge middle finger and gave himself the title of God of Doom and their rivalry would continue for multiple thousands of years. It had started thousands of years before they even arrived at Zatera, and it's continued until recent times. Though that's not really why the rivalry actually started. There's no definite start point on the start of the rivalry, but it definitely started sometime when they were under the tutelage of the god known as Yizar Raptorus. Now, Yizar Raptorus had become a god much longer before any of them became gods. Raptorus obtained his godhood through war, a long time before any of them were even born. Though back when Zatera was born, there were other gods present as well. Another pair of gods is Tok Zafiz and Tok Medez. Zafiz was known as the god of life, and just an aside here, but there are no official female versions of titles. A god or a goddess in the 776 gods is just called a god. So back to Zephyrs. She was known as being a bit unstable, and also had made some deals with demons in the past. The past in the perspective of present day. And the other god that I mentioned, Medez, was the god of matter. He was more or less the forge god, but also served a lot of different purposes throughout his career. Hang on to your butts though, this is way more gods that we need to discuss. We're not going to discuss every single one in depth in this video but we're going to at least mention most of the important ones. So next up is the tutor of both Zephyrs and Medez, and that would be Yizar Takaus. Raptorus, the mentor of the other two, knew Takaus for quite a while as well. And when Raptorus took on the other two, Takaus decided, hey, why not? And so she took on some students of her own. There was a third member of this group being Raptorus Takaus and this third person. The third person being a god known as Dracus. Dracus was always mysterious, and he didn't communicate with the other two very much, but he was in contact with them, and they were in contact with him. He becomes important in later stories. So earlier, I mentioned that Zephyrs was in contact with demons. Well, next up, we've got the demons that she was in contact with. The first of the demons that she was in contact with was Skrill Astroth. Skrill Astroth was the first member of the Skrill race of demons. And practically all true demons that came after were created by either Astroth or somebody that he created. At the time of the realm's creation, there was another demon god. This god was known as Skrill Kokura, and is the namesake of modern-day Kokura's Rift. In all technicality, these two Skrill demons were technically siblings, but because they were created and not born, there's no real issue there, I guess, considering the fact that most people would say that they were married, air quotes. Astroloth was always known for being fairly warlike, 
and he made his legions follow this principle. Kokura, however, was a lot more cunning. She did a lot of research into things that most people would try to hide, or at least not research at all, because it was way too dangerous. So, next up we have a group of three gods that are all fairly low power levels, but are still important. These gods are the Night Valor, Skivor Ikram, and the Grand Magus Warren. Now, I had mentioned earlier that the Night Valor had become one of the new Arbiters. This was mainly because of his relationship to Dremay. He usually saw Dremay as sort of a father figure, and even though he had made some mistakes in his Yarnka life, he was still given that position because he was trying his best to do the right thing. The Grand Magus Warren, while she had friends in high places, like the other more powerful gods of the Pantheon, she spent most of her time dealing with mortals. She was the chair of the Magic Council when it was still in operation. Lastly, we move on to Skivor Ekrum. He's always been a sort of a loner. He's not necessarily a bad guy, but he's not necessarily too public. Even to this day, we still know very little about him. In lore, that is. Next on our list of gods, we've got Enigma, who ironically, really isn't that much of an enigma. Enigma was born as a fragment of Raptorus, and when he was first born, he was fairly malleable. He didn't really have a personality of his own at the time. However, as time progressed, he turned into a mishmash of sort of a trickster god and also a magical researcher. He frequently butted heads with Haral as well, not for any real reasons other than the fact that they just wanted something to fight over, and they just happened to be the reason for each other. Enigma, while not being horrible but powerful on his own, was definitely influential in multiple points in the past, but we'll be covering him in a different video, just like a lot of these gods. Next up, we've got the two demon brothers, though I suppose we'll throw in their more powerful brother as well. So the most powerful of the three is Skrill Ashura. He is the oldest son of Skrill Astroth. He's well known among the gods for his bizarre appearance. His lower half is a metal snake, his upper half is a humanoid torso with eight arms, and his head is literally the handle to a giant god sword. His title is the God of Souls, which he's very knowledgeable in. Maybe not the most knowledgeable, but compared to a lot of the other gods of the Pantheon, he's the expert. The middle brother of the three brothers is known as Bruzal Maximus, although he goes by another name, which is his real name, Skrill Bruzal. Bruzal is known of one of the twin kings of the kingdom of Zarya, the other being a king named Ryan, spelled R-Y-O-N, not R-Y-A-N. It's unique, right? He's known to have powers over time and space, although he's way weaker than his older brother and leagues beneath his father. He's not going to be screwing up any timelines anytime soon. The youngest and honestly the least interesting of the brothers is Zakirian, Skrill Zakirian. He's way too quiet, and most of the gods don't trust him for that fact. He's known for deceiving mortals, and if he can, he'll try to deceive gods too, though his level of power makes that sort of dangerous for him. He's even weaker than the middle brother. But if Zakirian seemed like the weird red-headed stepchild of the family, that honor actually goes to Yura Naoikre. He's technically Skrill Astroloth's brother. But there is basically no god in the Pantheon that sees it that way. Yira is a nightkin, and he's also the weakest of those three siblings, being Kokura, Astroth, and Yira. And we're talking multiple orders of magnitude weaker. Astroth is an elder god, where Yira is a lesser god. There's an entire tier between the two. And on top of that, he spends most of his day just being a clown, throwing himself through portals to entertain the other gods. Now, moving on from the demons and their siblings, we move on to two sets of background gods. They aren't in the limelight, and they like it that way. The first set are the Elenatus brothers, Sin and Mel. The Elenatus brothers were just thieves until Drume came along and... <laughs> gave them godhood and a place in the Pantheon as long as they stopped causing trouble, which they mostly did, afterwards effectively becoming intel gatherers for the gods. The other set is a group of gods known as the Energy Clan, also known as the Wolf Gods. The Wolf Gods have an interesting biology that allows them to channel much more mana through their bodies than most other things can, and they use this fact to help the Pantheon. They have a special spell that 
they designed themselves that's used to cure and destroy impurities in the realm. We're not talking like street urchins here. We're talking like pockets of corruption or void rot or something like that. While nonetheless extremely useful to the Pantheon, like I said, they don't spend much time in the limelight and they like it that way. The last of the lesser gods that we're going to discuss here is Ruki Krayoina, which honestly is often just shortened to Ruki. He's known as the god of ancient blood, and he was born straight from a realm known as the Whisper, which is also known as a realm of madness. And since we're on the topic of the Whisper, let's discuss that next. The Whisper is both a realm and a being. The being is the actual arbiter, and it can visit the pantheon on Zetera. While they can both be referred to as the same thing, most people call the being, the arbiter, the whisperer. In terms of other gods, Ruki was born extremely recently, like less than 10 years old, and he's just as naive. He was also, for some reason, born fluid in Veratian, a mostly dead language, mostly just used for curse magic. In fact, in Veratian, his name literally translates to Bloodseed. So moving up a tier to the greater gods is where we find people like Haral, Zephiz, Medez, Skrlashera, and also this is where Drame was before he attained the title of Yizar. Though the title of Yizar was mainly just a badge of office, he's really an elder god. There's only one being in this classification that's important that we haven't discussed yet, and that's Takrayal. Of the small group of greater gods, he is easily the most powerful, much more powerful than Skrilashara. Takrael is known as the god of magnitude, and this is quite literal. He changes the magnitude of things, such as his emotions, which allows him to project them into the world as storms, or sometimes even violent natural disasters. And now we go up one more tier. We arrive at Elder God, though in this category there's also only one god that we haven't discussed. That god is Moraglakios. She was Haral's lover before he left for the war. She's an ascendant water mage, which means she's literally made of water. And while there are gods that are more powerful than her, she's one of the most knowledgeable on the subject of water magic. And while the two of them did have children, they weren't biological. They were rescued from a burning village. And so we arrive at the last category, ancient gods. There's only one ancient god on Zetera. This is excluding an ancient god that was previously here known as Siskar, the ancient of the primeval skies. He left for the war like many other gods. This last remaining ancient, this last remaining god of the pantheon, is known as Rahamir, the ancient of wisdom. Even among mortals, her library is known wide and far. And if you have enough mana to give her, she'll gladly give you some of her knowledge. Though only gods can access the library itself. If you're immortal and you want to gain some of the knowledge, you have to give her mana through one of her knowledge sprites. So depending on who you ask, we've got technically one more ancient god, though it really, like I said, does depend on who you ask. This ancient god is Shalos. Shalos is known as the Dragon Mother. She was the one who brought all of the dragons to Zetera. Shalos also had a son. His name is Surge. His name is spelled really weird, but it's pronounced Surge. Surge is known as being a genocidal maniac, and you would not be incorrect to call him that. He's killed countless of his followers countless times just to increase his own power. He's known as the Storm Rider, and for good reason. To finish off this trio of dragon gods, we have the Time Child. Her name is Cardis, and she is a little ball of chaos. Anybody could tell you that. Her father Surge had to get an expert tracker just to find her the moment she was born, because for some reason, she decided to teleport off to some unknown land. The last big important god? People are still unsure on where to fit him in the sort of power spectrum. The war that I keep mentioning is with a group known as the Voids, and this god was a defector. His name is Shakus, and he was known as the Lord of Warfare. Although outside of this, and the fact that we know that he destroyed many worlds in his time, we don't know much about him, and honestly, we're not likely to learn much more about him anyways, because he left to help the gods with the war. So if you've stayed through the entire video, I thank you for listening to me. And believe me, I plan on going in-depth in all of the topics that I've brought up in this video. With that being said, 
Thank you for watching or listening, and I'll see you next time. This has been Maxi of the 776 Gods. Have a good one.